Um, we're going to talk about tonight, I, I, if you remember a few months ago, I was going to do what the guys do, and then it got a little bit too difficult for me, so I said I'm going to go on something else, but they kind of came back to something that I'm interested in. So, not that I'm not interested in. <laughs> that I could actually speak into and not be like, okay, what did you just say, Eric? What is that word again? That kind of thing. That's what I meant. Um, his title was, you don't pursue biblical counseling? What is wrong with you? Right? Instead of like, you're going to counseling? Oh, what's wrong with you? It's opposite. So the goal is honestly to change that viewpoint. To change that, as Christians, we are to admonish one another. We are to go to counseling and get, get sharpened, right? Iron sharpens iron. So that's what we're going to kind of talk about today, is what is biblical counseling? So I encourage you all to go check out those videos that Eric and Nick put together on what is newthetic counseling. Like Nick goes into what does newthetic mean and newthesia, something or other which basically means to admonish one another. But he goes into all the nitty-gritty details of the Bible verses and that sort of thing that really encapsulate what is biblical counseling. So I encourage you to go to that and also check out Eric's talk because I can never do any. He has his own strengths. I have my own strengths, right? <laughs> so together, hopefully God will make sense of it. But let me go through some Bible verses to help us see that it is biblical to go to counseling. Romans 15, 14, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Because that's really what Kara did. She instructed us just now on how the Holy Spirit works and how forgiveness really is. Isn't that right? She was, so thank you for that instruction. Hebrews three thirteen, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Titus 2, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing hymns and psalms, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And then Colossians 1.28 and 29, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we, we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. And there's many more verses also on instructing one another, encouraging one another, listening to godly counsel. Those are just some of the examples. Um, so... Basically, biblical counseling is encouraging ourselves and others to walk in obedience to God's word. Plain and simple, right? Um, so what is it not? Something that we have to be careful is you hear a lot of counselors and you hear a lot of psychologists. Well, I'll just go to a psychologist. They're a Christian. It's like, well, how were they taught? Were they, is, are they teaching through the word of God? Is it biblical? Is it rooted in the Bible? Or is it rooted in man's thought and man-centered? Because anything that's not driven by the Holy Spirit and not rooted in the Word of God is rebellion against God. So we must be careful in who we seek out to actually help counsel us, to help mentor us, to help encourage us. We have to be sure that it's biblical. Um, or else we're going to be going down the wrong path. Got to be very careful. Um, and I kind of want to go through a little bit of, okay, what does that look like? So I'm going to kind of share a little bit of my story. Um, I've been in community now for 20 plus years, but not really in the sense of like teaching until maybe 15 years. But So for the first couple years when I was in community and I had a group of people that were listening to me, I wasn't a Christian, right? So I didn't know anything. So I just handed people books. <laughs> here you go, that I didn't read. It, they're just books other people read that they were good. Okay, here, here you go, here you go. I didn't really have a heart necessarily for people. I didn't know. I didn't know Christ at the time. So I didn't know really what the soul was or anything like that. I was just doing whatever people told me to do. Hand out books to help people out with their situations. <laughs> That's what I did, right? So then I became a Christian. 
And my whole worldview changed. Everything changed. My whole paradigm shifted, obviously. But I was still brand new. Brand new. People would come to me with marital problems. I wasn't married. People would come to me with, how do you raise children? I'm like, I don't know. Here's a book. And I would give them a book, which was good. But here's a good thing that I did do is I did have a counselor. I had a mentor that I was able to talk to and say, okay, this is what the situation that happened. How do I help this person? And they were there to be able to help me help them. Okay, and one mistake that I did a lot of times, <laughs> a lot of times, was I would act first and then ask. And one time it really was bad. So someone was in love, right? And she already had kids from a different guy. And she started coming to church, right? And I was so excited. I got somebody to come to church and... I'm not sure quite where she was at, right, spiritually, but she came to church a couple times, and I thought, okay, great. She wants to serve the Lord. She wants to honor him. So I found out they were having sex outside of marriage, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, oh, my God, you got to get married, <laughs> right? She met this guy in the car on the road, right? Um, but he seems such like such a nice guy, right? And she wanted to honor God. So I, I said, you got to get married. Oh my goodness. You can't have sex with outside of marriage. Get married, get married, get married. So not that she did it because of, of me, but I encouraged her to get married. And then, at, and then later on we found out, okay, he actually deals drugs, did drugs, did drugs in the basement with her kids. And she did not like that. <laughs> that was like really bad. So I'm getting divorced. And it was awful. So then I went back to my mentors and I said, um, this happened. And they're like, well, I would have never told them to get married. <laughs> Lori, you tell them to stop sinning. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> right, right. I mean, oh, right. So there's a weightiness. Truly, there's a weightiness when you sit down and want to help somebody in their situation. But here's one thing that the Bible says, that we have the light within us. So we are able to share. We are able to counsel and help give advice because we have the light of God within us. So if someone comes to you uh, from work, someone comes to you um, with your, from your family, someone comes to you in the church and asks you a question, it's like, stop for a second. Pray for the Spirit to give you wisdom and go ahead. You know, go ahead. But here's the thing. Don't do like I did. Well, I guess, you know, if you're in the Spirit, right, He'll guide you and guide your words. But counsel with somebody afterwards. So this is what happened. What do you think? Because you want to be in a process of learning. So as we mentor with people and as we mentor people, you always have to have a hand up and a hand down. So like we're bringing somebody with us, but yet we're counseling forward because what if you're counseling somebody and you do it wrong? You can go back and say, hey, I did check with my mentor. That's probably not the best thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, and I apologize to that girl. Oh my golly. I still feel like so bad about that, but it wasn't my fault. God has a plan in everything, but yeah, I should have been a little wiser. <laughs> so why do we need biblical counseling? Uh, my mentor told me this. It's an excellent quote. The gap to what the Bible says and what we do is the flesh. <laughs> Think of that. The gap to what the Bible says and what we actually do is all the flesh. It's like I got a lot of flesh in me. When I read my Bible, I'm like, oh, golly, oh, golly, oh, golly. That's a lot of flesh in there. And with the flesh comes deceitfulness. We get deceived. We think we're doing pretty good. We think we got it all figured out. Oh, contraire, when you read your Bible, it slaps you in the face sometimes. It slaps me in the face a lot. So that's where that need, the need of somebody to come in and just say, hey, what do you see that I'm not seeing? Are you seeing something that I need to really work on? You know, and for, of course you... Uh, read your Bible and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal things to you. But don't be deceived thinking that that's all you need because God does say we are to burden each other with our burdens. We are to carry each other's load. So we, we want to do that. Um, we can and we must conform to the will of God. Deception will creep in. So we were out counseling the other day with a couple. 
And they told us this story. And I want to share you the story because it has, it has literally messed me up in a good way, in a really good way. Okay, so this couple has been in ministry for 35 years or something. Don't quote me on numbers ever. <laughs> They've been married for a long time and in ministry for a long time. Well, I don't know if it was about seven years into the marriage or so. Um, things were going great. They were ministering. And one of the comments that was commonly said to them is we are so thankful that you're ministering here because your marriage is so good. Your marriage is so strong. You have the, the best marriage. Thank you so much for having the best marriage that we can follow. Right? Um, the woman was really seeking the Lord, reading her Bible, doing great. Well, she started working out, right? And the guy next to her started talking to her. So she started witnessing to this guy, doing a very righteous thing. We are called to witness, right? Witnessing to this man. Unbeknownst to her, he was a serial adulterer. This man started coming to church, started talking to the pastor, her husband, started telling her all these things and him all these things that, oh yeah, you know, God is calling me. I can feel him calling me. So they thought, you know, he's going to become a member. He's a, she's, she's witnessing to this man. She's at the height of her spirituality right now. Things are going great. Slowly but surely, he starts giving her little compliments here, little compliments there. Not that the husband never gave her compliments because he did. But this deceitfulness slowly slept in, uh, crept, crept into their marriage. Before you know it, the unthinkable happened. She had an affair. This was a godly woman to a godly man. Since then, they have sought restoration. They had go to, gone to biblical counseling to handle all of that stuff. But he, he approached her. And he said, are you having an affair? And she says, yes, I am. I'm so sorry. I don't know how this happened. And she repented that minute, stopped that minute, but still the deed was done and trust was broken. They had to stop ministering and, you know, they, they took time off and they moved up to their family and everything. But what got me so much is that she did everything right. She set up boundaries for her marriage. Well, I set up boundaries for my marriage. She didn't watch sexy movies or the television shows like all those that are out there. She didn't watch that stuff. They were, she was very guarded. I don't watch this stuff. I'm very guarded. Um, they had a good marriage. I feel we have a good marriage. That would never happen to me. How many of you guys think that? That would never happen to me. I would never do that. Because that's my piousness, is that I would never do that. But here's a woman that's just like me, in a sense, that put up all these boundaries on the top of her game, loved ministering with her husband, had no intention of having an affair. But what does it say? That sin is like a, a lion, right? Ready to devour. It was like that man was crouching down, ready to jump on her. And she fell. It's like we have to be careful in our walk. We have to put down our pious, our high horse, that we're better than anybody because we're not better than anybody. It's like we need each other to hold each other accountable, to say, hey, something's not quite right here. How is everything going? We need to be able to encourage one another in our walk with the Lord. It's like God has everything worked out, and she is now... She just went to the Czech Republic sharing her story and is bringing so much glory to God. But we just need to be careful, don't we? We need to be careful not to be pious, not to be so hard-headed that it won't happen to me. I'm not like that. Oh, yes, we are, for our heart is full of wickedness. Um, so how? How do we pursue a mentor? Um, the first mentor... I would say is your husband or a parent. Um, when's the last time that you asked your husband a question or your parent a question? Say, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? How do you think my walk is going? <laughs> be careful. Be prepared to be soft if it gives you a rough answer. You know, kindly tell me how is my walk going? <laughs> you know, right? 
Um, but that really should be our first mentor is our husband. Um, or you can find a mentor, a coach, a counselor, someone who's trained with getting results. So if you sometimes, right, you have friends that might give you advice, give you advice, give you advice, but they're not changing you. You want somebody who has influence in your life that you can actually talk to and they can help direct your path along with Bible reading and such. Uh, peer, peer counselors between each other. We encourage each other in the word. Godly living. How do we live godly? How can we encourage one another? Just in our daily walk. Talk about the Lord. Talk about what you're reading. Talk about it with each other. Even if someone's not there, if you're there, talk about it because it encourages the other person. Talk about what God is doing in your life. Um, protege, pour back into others. If someone's pouring into you, pour back into others. Pour back. Hey, let's go get a coffee. How's it going? So I have an intent. I have an intent to see how's your spiritual life. Ask that question. I ask that all the time. You guys probably all know that. How's your spiritual walk going? How's it going with the Lord? How are you feeling? Are you feeling his presence? Are you feeling his spirit? You know, it's, it's good to do that. Um, and sometimes people get a little bit, like, confused between a friend versus a mentor. My mentor, Lori, says it's called a friend tour, right? It's like somebody who is seeking advice to get a perspective change. A friend is there to just, you know, maybe a friend is a little different. It's a friend tour, so you're really, every mentor should be a friend to you first. Obviously, you got to care about the next person. But a mentor is almost the next level. Someone who cares enough to tell you the truth. Sometimes it's hard and you might lose that friend over that truth. But you have to always, of course, have a heart that you want to guide them in the right, on the right steps. Right? So you have to be able to look for that. You have to be able to seek advice. Be open to let people in. Be open to listen to what somebody might have to say, even if it might make you feel a little bit less prideful, right? Sometimes we're so prideful, we, won't, we don't want people to know the true us. No, man, open it up. Open it up. That's the only way we're going to honor God is if we open up, ladies, and we tell people our struggles and say, man, I'm, I need help. We all have struggles, and we all need help in some form or another. Um, do we want it to be a feel-good meeting or a breakthrough meeting? I'm sure you guys have heard that before. Feel-good meeting or a breakthrough meeting? It's like, feel good meaning, maybe that's where your friend is. Oh, your husband did that. No, I can't believe it. You know, which, friends shouldn't do that anyway. <laughs> so be careful who you're hanging out with if they do that. Um, but the goal is to lead people to truth through the Holy Spirit. That is our complete goal. So the goal is biblical living and holy living. Um, you show how you love God by how you love and serve others. Are we able to open up with others? And are we able to help and love and serve one another? Um, you live the truth, you share the truth. It's like you live it, you share it. You live it, you share it. You live it, you share it. That's the goal that God has intended us to go and make disciples of all nations. Um, qualifications for what a good mentor looks like or how to become a good mentor. Knowledge of the scripture have divine wisdom through personal experience. People don't have to go through exactly the same experience that you go through, but at least experience in life. Experience that you got knocked down and the Lord kept you get back up. The circumstances are always different, and that's okay. Um, but just that someone has gotten through it. Um, unbinding your own heart. Have you seen your own sinful heart? Those usually are good mentors, someone who's been broken. And you can tell when you meet this woman, and I hope to bring her in one day to, to speak for us, this woman who had the affair, um, her heart is so towards God because it has been broken and you could see God's presence in her life. You can see it. I mean, it's just like, she's awesome. It's, it's an incredible story how God used that. Um, you have a heart for people. The, people. the person that you're talking to, do they, do they like people? <laughs> do they care for you? If they don't care for you, stay away. If they're in it for their own glory, and I'm, let me tell you what to do. I have this, this, this. I know what to do. They just walk away. They, there's no heart there. <laughs> walk away. Good friends, but not someone that you really want to trust and confide in. Um, filled with faith and hope. Faith, knowing that the Holy Spirit is working when he works, that hope that he can renew the mind. Because that is what the Holy Spirit does. He renews our mind. That's what we need. That's what we want. 
Um, and someone who is a prayer warrior. Do these people pray? Are they prayer warriors? Can they help pray for the situation for me? Do they have a heart for God? So that's kind of uh, who you want to look for in a mentor and how you want to become part of that mentor. Because that is both. We always got to have two hands, one hand up, one hand down. And you, we got to walk through that way.